And I think as we reframe debt, we're going to be able to have that big picture conversation in a safe, gentle, judgment-free and caring way and really explore what it means to have debt and kind of poke holes in the illusion that so many people have that if you have debt, you are therefore a bad person, or if you have debt, you are therefore bad with money or any number of the other toxic messages we send to ourselves. Hello, beauty, and welcome back to the Loving Money Podcast with Lise Wilcox, and I am your host, Lise Wilcox herself. I am a strategic life and business coach and have been for the better part of 10 years, and I am passionate about helping women make more money. This podcast is the place to be if you want to name, de-shame, and reframe your relationship with money so that you can totally reframe your relationship with life. Now, today we are, (laughs) if you're watching this, not listening to this, but if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see I've got my glasses on because today's a very serious, like capital, a serious episode. We're talking about debt. Now, trigger warning, we are talking about debt, but I want this episode to be a complete reframe on debt. So many of us carry not only a lot of consumer debt, but a lot of shame and a lot of guilt, and a lot of self-judgment about the levels of debt that we carry. And my intention for this episode is that you walk away from this feeling a lot lighter, more lighthearted, more peaceful, and more compassionate in how you view yourself and relation in your relationship to debt. Before we get started, you know, the antidote to debt is making more money. <laughs> and It's kind of hard to make more money sometimes if you don't know how or why to charge what you're worth. So if you haven't done this already, I'm going to strongly encourage you, strongly and lovingly encourage you to head over to leasewilcox.com right now and download your free video training of my signature pricing strategy, charge what you're worth. This is the mind blowingly simple. Like it's so simple. It's going to make you angry. (laughs) Honest to God. It's this simple, simple tool that I use not only in my own business, but for the countless of other women that I work with both in the mastermind and in my private coaching, how to actually move beyond the Instagrammable charge what you're worth and add tax and actually teach you how to charge what what you're worth. Even if you feel like you're not comfortable with numbers or you're not comfortable gasp with your value, this is a really, really, really simple pricing strategy that you're going to love. So, and it's free. So it's like a, maybe a half an hour video training. It's available on my website, leaseblowcox.com. Check it out and start charging what you're worth because when you make more money, Ultimately, what we're trying to do is get you to make more money so you can have less debt. (laughs) That's one of the many, many side effects, right? One of the many bonuses. Before we begin today's episode and really dig into the heart of it, I would love to share with you another beautiful review from a listener. Thank you, Amelia Lane, for this awesome five-star review. It says, one of my favorites. I adore this podcast. Every single episode leaves me thinking and often gives me tools and strategies to apply in my own life. Awesome. That is the whole point. I'm so glad it's working. You know, I'm Dutch and I'm a Taurus, so I am nothing if not ridiculously practical and down to earth. And so while I think it's really important to look at theory and context and big picture thinking to conceptualize everything, looking at the energetics, talking about, you know, the... I don't know what do you call it, like the philosophy of stuff. Like I'm a big overthinker. I really like to look at all of the moving pieces. So I understand the context of what we're talking about. And then I like to get laser focused and give really actionable, practical tools that allow you to implement what we're talking about in day-to-day life. So, you know, look at this macro issue of how fucked up the patriarchy is, but then give micro tools to help make your daily life better. I really like the marriage of both. So I'm really glad that's working once again. Thank you, Amelia Lane, for that beautiful review. How does that apply today? Well, as I said, we're going to talk about reframing debt. And I think as we reframe debt, we're going to be able to have that big picture conversation in a safe, 
gentle, judgment-free, and caring way, and really explore what it means to have debt and kind of poke holes in the illusion that so many people have that if you have debt, you are therefore a bad person, or if you have debt, you are therefore bad with money, or any number of the other toxic messages we send to ourselves. Man, I have worked with so many people, or I should say I have been on the cusp of working with so many people who have the opposite approach, that they're like, no, I cannot take on debt to work with you. And to me as a business coach, like anybody who knows anything about business and economics will tell you, this might be an unpopular thing to say as a female business coach or a female entrepreneur, but anybody who knows anything about money and how it works will tell you it takes money to make money. And I have noticed that a lot of female entrepreneurs are so reluctant to take the risk and bet on themselves because of a whole, oh my gosh, like you want to talk about picture, big picture. We can talk about the early days roots, how girls are very, very, very seldom encouraged to take risk in their play. We are more conditioned to like play house and play kitchen and share and take turns and, you know, talk it out. Like we are so conditioned to be far less risk averse versus little boys who tend to be conditioned. And I know this is a very like heteronormative example, so forgive me, but typically in the past, what it has looked like is for little boys to be, to grow up in this, well, boys will be boys, you know, there they go flinging themselves off the sofa again. I've had girlfriends who've had boys and they're always like, boys are just so different. Like you have no idea. And, you know, I was a Montessori teacher for a lot of years and I watched how kids play and I've, I've raised girls obviously in my own life. I've had a lot of access to like boys in the classroom context, but like boys at home with their parents, there's kind of a different expectation that they are. They're going to be like more rough and tumble. They're going to get into trouble. And if girls were to do that same behavior, girls get punished more for it. Whereas boys, it's like, oh, like for fuck's sake, when are you going to stop this? But it seems to be more permissible and forgivable. I, again, I appreciate that might piss some people off. That's my, that's my own observational experience and truth. So even looking at that like tiny example, but kind of a systemic example from very, very early on, girls are conditioned not to be risk takers. So then you fast forward 30, 40 years, and now you have a woman running her business who's never been encouraged to bet on herself, to have the, the confidence in her own ability, to have the, the real courage to trust herself and trust her gut beyond any of the outside information. And she's unsure as to how to take a risk. And in, in this case, you know, specifically for example, with the, like the example of working with me, a lot of women I find are reluctant to take that leap financially because they're so conditioned to save or, you know, like just hoard it and hoard that money and not go into debt. Well, that's problematic because there are, you know, as we're going to talk about in this episode, there are certain kinds of, there are certain kinds of debt. We've got good debt. We've got bad debt good debt tends to be the kind of debt that you're investing in yourself and in your future that has a legitimate return on investment. I would also argue beyond the, like the measurable finances of the ROI, we could look at that and call it a return of impact as well. You know, look at all the investments that maybe you've made, maybe some of your colleagues or family members have made that have not only returned in spades financially, but have returned like, and like over delivered in terms of the impact that they then bring back to your life. Now, as I said, if you were somebody who's really risk averse or reluctant to take that leap, how the hell do you get ahead? Like how the hell do you break out of your own existing level, your comfort level, this one plateau, if you just keep doing it the same and you don't invest in like taking yourself to a bigger place, how the hell do you do it? Like you stay stuck or you you get stuck playing small because you don't have the, the courage, the conditioning, the permission from yourself or, or others to just fucking do it, <laughs> you know? And so I think this is an, this episode is really, really important for us in, in a lot of ways. So let's start here. 
There's no question that there are certain kinds of debt we don't want to carry. And let's just call it bad debt. And even though we're calling it bad debt, it's more like, what's actually a better reframe for this? Did you ever watch the Sun Tots and the Smoggies? <laughs> I'm hoping you did, because I think that's actually the analogy we're going to use. The Sun Tots and the Smoggies was like this cartoon in, I want to say, the 90s or perhaps the early aughts, as they say now, like the early 2000s. And it was like, I guess you could call it greenwashing now, but it was about these little happy sun tots who lived in the land of like eco-diversity, biodiversity, and they were like great stewards of the planet. God bless the sun tots. And then, and then you had the smoggies and they had this like, oh, the smoggies were like dark. They were gloomy. They were like puking oil into the oceans. They were like very bad for the environment. But I just have this visual in my head. And I honestly, I could sing the theme song for you if you want me to. But the sun tots and the smoggies, like they had to find a way of working together to, to inhabit the land. And I feel like instead of calling one good and one bad, they just serve different purposes, right? So for our debt, we're going to call it, <laughs> this is either going to be a great success or you're going to like leave this podcast being like, girl, you are crazy. <laughs> Maybe it's a little bit of both. So we're going to talk about what is traditionally known as bad debt as the smoggies, okay? And we're going to talk about what is traditionally known as good debt as the sun tots. And then we're going to just cross our fingers and hope for the best that this is a, a metaphor that translates. So that smoggy style debt is debt that is unsecured by an asset or it doesn't have an ROI on it. So for example, let's say you are an overspender and for a, as an overspender, you are like, I'm going to do an episode on this too, but if you're an overspender, what you're really likely doing is not being a bad person or not being bad at money. You are just trying to create a sense of safety and security that you don't otherwise have in your life. And so you spend and spend and spend. Maybe you are an American listener and some of that debt has gone into like a freak medical crisis that you didn't foresee coming and you just didn't have the cash to finance it. And so you go further into this debt that you needed to take on, but it doesn't really have a financial ROI money that you owe that helps you build wealth or is, or is attached to an asset. So for example, if you are a homeowner, your mortgage debt is considered to be more of the sun tots style debt because not only is it backed up by an asset, but it's a vehicle that you're putting money into to help you build wealth. So even though the average, certainly in Canada, in Canada, it's a lot higher than the States, but in Canada, like the average, the average mortgage debt is like close to half a million bucks. That's a shit ton of debt. Canada is actually the, has the highest consumer debt out of all the G7 countries right now. It's a shit ton of debt, but a lot of that, of that mortgage debt is considered to be, again, in the camp of sun tot style debt, because you know it's going to bring you an ROI if you're smart about it, or if you hit the market timing just right, or it's, and it's also helping you build wealth. It's like a vehicle to build wealth. Investing in yourself and making smart decisions there is also, it can be considered, I would call it good debt, but I, I'm super biased. But it, in my own experience, I know what I have invested in myself more often than not. There's an episode coming up on, oh, so you got conned. Now what? Which I will tell you about in detail. But for the most part, anytime I've spent cash on investing in myself, even if I've taken on debt to do it, Holy shit, not only is the return of investment doubled, tripled, quadrupled, but the return of impact on my life, like it has literally made me the person that I am today. So I'm like a walking, walking poster child for sun tot debt. My point is that not all debt is created equal. So when we hear some numbers that are kind of floating around in the, the 24 hour news cycle, that North Americans on average have a little over 21,000 in non-mortgage or consumer debt, that 17% of them um, outspend what they earn, or this is heartbreaking, that 25% have taken on personal loans to cover basic expenses like food and bills. 
That's scary, right? Those numbers sound really scary. The flip side of the coin is that there can, like, and again, that's a great sign of why these conversations are so important because when we don't have enough money, like when we have to take on debt just to, just to live, like just to live this life, to take on debt, to do that when we're financing our, our basic expenses, not even financing a lifestyle, like a, a lifestyle that's beyond our means, but just financing our basic human needs. I don't know about you, but to me, that's excellent feedback that we need to empower more people to make more money because that's, that's just not fair. Like there's so much injustice built into that, right? There is such a good, there is such a thing as taking on kind of quote unquote, the wrong kind of debt or debt that doesn't move you forward. It doesn't build wealth. Credit card debt is a great example at like a 20% interest rate. You very seldom are able to pay off your principal debt and you spend so much time just paying off the interest. That's more smoggy style. However, we can't look over or gloss over the fact, especially considering this is a predominantly female audience that we're, that we're talking to right now, we can't gloss over the fact that not all debt is bad debt. Not all debt belongs to the smoggies. Some of us little happy little sun tots are over here with debt too, and that's okay. You're allowed to make decisions, even if it feels like an uncomfortable risk, you're allowed to make decisions that move you forward even if you don't feel confident, I feel like if you're listening to this podcast, you have a level of confidence that you may not even know about. You have deep reserves of capabilities, talents, strategies. You've got it all. And you've got that skill set and the tools to help you make informed, powerful, and empowered decisions that move your own personal dial forward without needing to get trapped in the, <gasps> but that would mean debt. Like, yes, sometimes taking a risk or making an investment in yourself or in your life, it is going to require you to, to, to take on debt. If you read, what's it called? Shoe Dog. Have, have you read Shoe Dog by Phil Knight? It's the story of Nike. They made a movie, what's it called? Air with my celebrity crush, Ben Affleck in it, Jason Bateman's in it, Matt Damon. It's got a whole cast of characters. It's very, very good. It's based on the deal that Nike made with Michael Jordan and Michael Jordan's such a boss about how he structured the residuals and the royalties of that deal. Great movie. But in, in tandem or running parallel to that story is the book, shoe dog. And it's the story of how Phil Knight and his basically buddies turned colleagues built Nike from the ground up. And it is crazy. I read it a few years ago. Yeah, I don't remember when, but I read it a good few years ago at, at a cottage with my family and I couldn't stop reading it. But I also couldn't stop crying as I was reading it because I was early-ish into my entrepreneurial experience, meaning that I had taken myself out of hobby mode and was really, really invested in like, oh, this isn't just a hobby. This isn't like coaching isn't like a thing I do because I like it and I will find other work on the side. This is something that I'm putting literally every egg I have in this one basket and I'm going to go all in you want to talk about risk and you want to talk about debt, we, we should chat. So I, this book kind of found me because it was just at the cottage that we happened to be at. And I was like, oh, this looks kind of cool. I'll read this. And as I said, I couldn't put it down, but more importantly, I couldn't stop crying because it, it felt like, it felt like somebody saw me. It felt like somebody, and I'm not comparing my business to Nike, just so we're clear here. There's no like covert narcissism going on. <laughs> I couldn't believe that the struggles he was identifying mirrored my own struggles, but on a, like a much, on a much bigger scale. So if you read this book, Shoe Dog, you'll read that Nike was literally always in debt, like, and they were always really successful, but they'd become successful and invest shit tons in getting themselves to the next level, catch up be on the verge of bankruptcy because they had taken on so much new debt. And then they'd like sell, 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 invest to create more products, sell, sell, sell. But the whole thing, 
like almost a 20 year process was a nail biter. And as they got more successful, they took on more debt. And I mean, it's like watching the Titanic, right? You know what happens at the end. So you kind of have this like commitment to seeing it through. Eventually they became fucking Nike, like one of the most iconic brands of all time. And like a, from a revenue perspective, also iconic. And I share that with you because it's just such a killer example, especially if you're an entrepreneur, it's such a killer example of what it means to make those sometimes cutthroat, sometimes gut wrenching, but again, I will stress well-informed and necessary decisions to do what it takes to move the dial forward. All that to say, we cannot paint debt with one brush because there are so many different shades that go into it. Yes, there are certain kinds of debt that we don't want to encourage anyone to get into because it becomes its own intrinsically, institutionally oppressive system. Like, you know, places like, what's it called? Money Mart. They're fucking predatory because they prey on folks who need cash now and they put such a premium interest rate on it that you'll never be able to take yourself out of that kind of, I'm just going to say it, bad debt. Forget the smoggies on this one. It's just like, it's a cesspool. They just, they prey on your vulnerability and urgency of access and they tax you to the tits for it or not tax you they 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 throw in so much interest on top of that that it is it becomes so easy to drown in the debt you've created and far less easy to swim your way through it that's a whole thing on its own but that doesn't dictate the tone of all other debt so my hope is in listening to this wherever you are whatever you're doing you have kind of a perspective shift to be able to reframe what different kinds of debt, what kinds of purposes different kinds of debt serves. If you were somebody who has that smoggy style debt, yeah, join the club. Like, did you hear those statistics? In North America, the average person, not average household, the average person carries over 20,000 worth of consumer debt. 17% of people outspend what they earn. There is a lot of debt happening. And I think it's naive. I was going to say stupid, but now I'm just like getting myself all worked up. It's kind of, it's kind of naive to think that we're the only ones that have debt. And, and that's why we have these conversations so that we can name it and then de-shame it. If you were somebody who's struggling with debt, you can talk to a debt consolidator. You can also let yourself off the hook a little bit and stop judging yourself so fiercely for being in debt because it happens. It bloody happens. We are given next to no financial education. We have next to no financial literacy. And then we become adults and it's like they hand us these keys to the kingdom. They're like, good luck, kid. And you're like, I don't know how to do this. Like, why did somebody put me in charge? You know, you're looking around for a grown up to help you and you're like, motherfucker, I am the grown up here. So I did a, an Instagram live with Bromwich and Smith not too long ago talking about this exact thing about how to reframe debt and like, De- reframe and de-shame debt. They're debt consolidators. This is not a sponsored post, but I think that just my experience with them as people, that would be a great place to start. But you you can like Google debt consolidators in your area and that could be a good empowering start to, to help you get out of that. But please let me be the one who gives you permission to like de-scarlet letter yourself, like de-stigmatize yourself if you've taken on too much debt. Like it it happens. And if you are an entrepreneur listening and you're like, oh man, I just paid off all my debt and I'm like really keen to, to move forward debt-free, I applaud you. I really, really do. I think that's a great goal. And please, and I want to, I'm not a financial advisor, so I want to be like really careful about how I phrase this, but please don't please don't say no to opportunities that could bring you so much ROI, not only in terms of of investment, but also an impact just because of a short-term cash flow mishap. You know, managing cash flow is, man, if you can manage cash flow as an entrepreneur, you are like dominating the entrepreneurship game, something that everybody struggles with. And it's like a long game as to learn how to master it. But if you, 
I've just watched so many people say no to incredible opportunities that you know are going to let them expand, flourish, grow their reach, grow their audience, refine their service, double their impact, double their revenue. And they say no because they don't have like the cash on hand right now. And they make these decisions out of fear, which holds them back. And that holding back keeps them playing small. And you watch it like businesses fold after the average business. No, not the average. 50% of businesses fold owned by women in the first five years. And again, unpopular opinion, but I cannot help but think that some of that is because women have been over conditioned to play it safe. And Yes, you have to make good decisions. I can't stress that enough. Yes, you have to make informed decisions. Yes, you have to find a a person or people that you connect with that you trust that are deeply rooted in integrity. And you also have to take some risk and allow yourself to invest in yourself and in your business, in your vision, in your talents, in your strategies. You have to allow yourself to do that if you really want to get ahead, in my humble, humble opinion. So... As a recap, let's just name the fact that like, (laughs) not everybody, but almost everybody has debt. Let's take the shame away from that by realizing you're not special or evil or a failure because you have debt. It's just something that happens. Life is very expensive. Life in the last couple of years has become ultra expensive and we're trying to course correct from that. And in the meantime, a lot of people are just figuring out how to do it and we're all bloody doing our best. So let's just ease up on the self-judgment and the and the inner the toxic inner critic and just allow yourself to bring some of your own inner sun tot to the party. You can reframe debt as being, yeah, there's more of a smoggy style where it doesn't give you a huge or any ROI or it isn't backed up by an asset. And of course, that is the kind of debt that we're working to avoid or pay off quicker than others. And the flip side is that there's a whole other category of debt that is really kind of, I hate to say it, required in order to move you forward and grow in the way, the way in which you really want to grow to create your own time freedom, financial freedom, and lifestyle freedom to just kind of live in a way that feels really, really good for you, that allows you the option to opt in, opt out, say yes or no, and not do things out of fear or because you feel like you have to. If this has resonated for you, share the love. We, I know money is a taboo subject and this might be a big ask, but hop on social. You can tag me at Lisa Wilcox on Instagram, on LinkedIn. Sometimes I'm even on Facebook, <laughs> just not very often, but please share this podcast with people in your community to help normalize and de- destigmatize, de-shame all things money related, especially, especially for women. If you're loving it, it would be amazing if you could take 30 seconds and hop onto Apple or Spotify and just click the review. Feel free to go all the way to the right to a five-star review if you're really getting value out of this and just leave a few words of feedback. You know, I love to share reviews. And lastly, again, hop over to my website. If you are interested in making more money, I have a free video training for you to start charging what you're worth there. Or if you are really interested in changing your whole relationship to money, you know, you've reframed your relationship to debt now, 29 minutes later, I've got a seven day course that will radically transform your self-sabotaging beliefs about money into sustainable long-term success. So thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day and I can't wait to see you next time on Loving Money, the podcast with Lisa Wilcox.